So this afternoon I'm going to talk a little bit about um, finding love for the world's loneliest frogs and about search for lost frogs and search for lost species, uh, which are campaigns that were uh, developed and designed to um, con connect people with conservation issues and some of the more less loved species in an emotive way. First, I'll start with an anecdote. Um, the artist Pablo Picasso was on the train one day when a passenger approached him and said, why don't you paint people the way they are? And Picasso responded, what do you mean the way they are? So the man pulled out a, his wallet, handed a photo to Picasso and said, well, this is my wife. And Picasso said, well, she's very small. She's very flat. So the way that we process and receive information depends on the frames through which we receive it. And these frames depend on our experiences, the stories we're told, the media. How people respond to a photo of a frog depends on what they think of frogs, whether they like frogs, whether they dislike frogs. These frames are developed as we, as we grow, as we experience the cultures we're, we're grown up in. But challenging or changing these sort of perspectives or, or these frames requires either personal experience or requires to be brought on a journey through story. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we apply this idea to the stories that we tell. Um, but first, I want to go back to my first ever selfie. When I was seven years old, this is a drawing that I did of me collecting frog spawn and putting it in, in an aquarium. And I show this not to bowl you over with my obvious artistic prowess as a child, but it's more prophetic of my metamorphosis from a young naturalist, scientist, artist, as I think everybody is when they're a child, through scientist, um, and then coming sort of full circle again to, to trying to figure out how to use art, photography, and storytelling to, to connect people with these issues. I went on to do a PhD. I took the path of a scientist studying frogs. And shortly after I finished my PhD, there was a global assessment. The IUCN did a global amphibian assessment that showed that at the time, a third of amphibians were threatened of extinction. Right now, 41% of amphibians. That's, that's 3,000 species threatened with extinction. And I was blown away that these animals that I'd grown up with, that I'd grown up you know, collecting the spawn, could disappear. It, it was incredible to me that, that, that they could be so threatened. So I became really interested in how do we protect them and how do we get people to care? Because if people don't care, then it's really hard to get them to, to connect with them. The, the canary in the coal mine analogy was coined that sort of highlighted that amphibians and early warning but it wasn't so early for the amphibians that were disappearing. And the canary in the coal mine, nobody ever went down to save the canary. So I was interested in figuring out how do we actually save the canary, regardless of the direct value or benefit to us in a very sort of self-serving way. So I swapped my calipers for camera and started exploring photography as a way of connecting people. And I think the art and photography and story can bring an emotional truth to the science. The underlying science is very important. But I soon discovered that just the assumption that if people know they will do something about it was, was not true, that people need to be made or to feel something to care. I went on to do a more conceptual photo project called Metamorphosis, where I transformed a conservation activist, Gabby Wilde, into a series of amphibians and photographed her with the amphibians. And the idea was to explore the idea that Despite changed form, we're all bound by the same fate of environment. I photographed her with a poison dart frog. These lose their poison when you keep them in captivity, feed them a different diet. That's what I told her. And I challenge anyone to look at a photo of a frog with this look in its eyes, reaching out for a finger, and not feel something for these animals. After days of body painting, the model was a little put out, and my favorite shot was just her finger. But I think the look on this frog's face said everything. I found that metamorphosis was a good conversation starter. It was a good way to get people's attention. But I hadn't really thought through the end of the narrative, what I wanted people to do once they felt something. Um, I didn't really have a journey to take people on beyond that. Um, and the truth was, I didn't really know the solution either. But I discovered the power of a narrative, of storytelling, to actually bring people on the journey through 
to search for lost frogs. This is a variable harlequin frog in Costa Rica. It was thought to have uh, gone extinct in the 1990s when it disappeared from Costa Rica and Panama. And then it reappeared in the early 2000s. So I wondered what other amphibians are still out there, and can we bring people on a journey to find out? Myself and colleagues at the Amphibian Specialist Group put together a list of 100 amphibians lost to science, and we put together a top 10, and I made this little poster. And this really um, snowballed. We quickly got support to send 33 teams into 21 countries looking for lost amphibians over six months. And we followed them through blogs, through real time, and we allowed people to come on that journey. One expedition went to the forests of Borneo in search of the Bornean rainbow toad, last seen in 1924. I got to go there and see one of my favorite frogs, of Wallace's flying frog here. And even though I've worked with amphibians for well, decades, I am still blown away by some of the diversity, some of the incredible colors, shapes, sizes. This one looked like it was carved out of wood. This is a young Bornean eared frog. But after eight months of, of searching, repeated expeditions, the team found the Bornean rainbow toad. This incredible and beautiful animal, first one ever photographed alive when they found it. And this elevated what would otherwise be an obscure, forgotten animal into a flagship for conservation of an incredible area. And it also produced some interesting news reach different audiences. And what blew my mind was just the attention that this campaign got. Over 600 news articles in, um, I think, 21 countries and a billion viewers. Um, so it was really incredible to me the power that a story had in getting people engaged and, and getting it um, you know, on the radar of the news media. Myself and colleagues at Global Wildlife Conservation, we decided to broaden the search for lost frogs. And I think of the search for lost frogs as something of a Trojan horse for delivering messages of extinction, of loss, of, of biodiversity and its importance in a, a nice package that is of good storytelling. Um, so we expanded it to, to mammals, birds, fish, um, plants, and we came up with the top 25. We worked with the IUCN species specialist groups for all taxa, so we reached out to over 100 scientists to get these nominations and to have that scientific rigor. And this Trojan horse was dressed in the shape of 007. We got uh, Daniel Craig to help us do a, a launch video for the search for lost species, holding a red-footed tortoise that peed on him right after we, I shot this. Neither of them are traumatized. And one of our first rediscoveries from the search for lost species, funnily enough, and I did not design this, but it was an amphibian, and it was called the Golden Wonder, Jackson's Climbing Salamander. And it was rediscovered in Guatemala on the fringes of a reserve that we had helped create to protect salamanders by a reserve guard that was employed to protect the area. So it was a really nice story, and we were able to leverage this to raise more support to help protect the this, this salamander and its habitat. But probably the most viral of the stories that have come out of the search for lost species so far is Wallace's giant bee. This is the world's largest bee. The bee wasn't flying over it when he took the photo. This is a composite that just for scale, that's a honey bee. And you can just see the magnitude of this. And I think visuals like this can just grab people's attention. And I think that's what caused this to, to spread. And this got 2.2 billion media impressions. And again, we are trying to leverage that to get some conservation outcomes to help protect this bee. It was already appearing in the trade before it was rediscovered. So we just wanted to shine the spotlight on it so that the world knew it still exists and it is threatened um, because these animals, invertebrates, don't often get the attention or the protection that they need. Of all the stories I think that we've told, however, none have captured the hearts of people around the world as much as that of Romeo. Romeo is a uh, Sawankas water frog in Bolivia. In 2009, he was found in a stream in the cloud forest, and a deadly fungus was sweeping through the habitat. This chytrid fungus has gone around the world, wiping out populations and species. So Romeo was collected to take into a breeding program with the idea that he would be taken out of harm's way, they would be bred, and once they had dealt with the threat in the wild, they would put them back. The problem was that they didn't find a single other individual frog. So repeated expeditions went out. So Romeo, meanwhile, was sitting in his tank in the museum in Cochabamba in Bolivia, 
Every year, his croak would get a little fainter until he stopped croaking around 2017. And we knew that Romeo was getting old, probably approaching, um, well, we didn't know how long he had left. So we teamed up with the partners in Bolivia, and we said, well, what can we do to help find Romeo his Juliet? So naturally, we turned to Match.com, and we created a profile for Romeo, gave him some character, and we reached out to Match, and they were really excited about this. And they said, anything that you raise online, we will match dollar for dollar. So we set a goal of $25,000 that would allow the team in Bolivia to go out and do thorough searches. We launched it on Valentine's Day, so we made e-cards that people could send each other with Romeo. And around 10 months later, after a lot of planning about where to search, how to search, and sensitizing the communities in the area, Juliet was found. The team led by Teresa in Bolivia miraculously came across the stream and found five more of the Sawenkas water frogs. The news of Juliet being found created a lot of attention, and suddenly everybody wanted to know, you know, when's the first date? We had to screen both of them for disease, but we introduced them, we had a first date, it got on the Colbert Show, second appearance of Romeo on the Colbert Show, and it got worldwide coverage. I mean, it, it went kind of crazy. Romeo has tried his best. It's been 10 years, so he's a little rusty. So they haven't yet produced any young, but we're hoping that will be the next step. Of course, Romeo got right on Twitter to talk about how nervous he was about the first date. He had sweaty nuptial pads. and. He's become a spokes frog, if you will, for this species, and also for other species. He recently wrote a letter to relatives of his in Chile who, who are under threat. And it was amazing to see people's response. Artists around the world would create art depicting this union, the love between Romeo and Juliet. We created a Happy Futures registry to allow people to support their future, new home, home furnishings, baby room, dinner dates, so a year's supply of worms. And what was really encouraging was to see how the local people really embraced Romeo as sort of a, a flagship, had real pride. And this is a group of kids holding up, saying, together we can save a species. So why did Romeo swim into the hearts of people around the world? I think it's a story that combined the familiar with the novel. And I think when you bring these things together, the familiar was the story of Romeo and Juliet. The novel was a Match.com profile for a frog. And I think that can create surprise and something memorable. We didn't take ourselves too seriously, even though the issue is obviously very serious. The story was personalized. My colleague Lindsay is incredible with the media, I reached out personally to every reporter she knew who might be interested and told the story of Romeo and Juliet. And we, just, we didn't try to pretend that Romeo was going to make you rich or better looking or better in bed. We really tried to stick to intrinsic values. We just try to engender empathy for Romeo. We told his story, and we said, if you care, support his quest for love. And people responded. So I'll just end with this thought from Pablo Picasso. Others have seen what is and asked why. I have seen what could be and asked why not. And I think the power of possibility is incredibly important. And the stories we tell carry with them values that are activated and ingrained and I think it's very important that we consider what values we are promoting in these stories that we tell. Thank you.